challenges that people have been doing. This is human piloted, somebody steering a drone remotely in a very complicated environment. So we'd like to do these kinds of things autonomously. There's a lot of challenges I think I'm going to get into, but uh, this is one of the motivations. And I think you can do a lot if you can crack this just with drones. For example, you could do the same thing in forests, which may be very useful for search and rescue. Uh, here's a drone that's racing a, is filming a, a race car, uh, kind of a race, which is also kind of interesting in entertainment. And more recently, I started seeing sort of, you know, a lot of roller coasters now um, have like these very um, talented pilots that film your roller coaster ride. Uh, so people seem to be interested in this. I'd like to emphasize that all of these examples that you're seeing here, these are extremely expert pilots. So this is, you could be playing with a drone for years and you may not be able to fly it this well. So this is kind of creme de creme, like the top of what human pilots can perform. Ideally, we'd like to do this and do more. Um, and I'd say that, you know, it just doesn't end here in drones, but if you were to be able to develop technologies that can maybe see the environment, see the world at a very high rate, uh, think about it very quickly, make rapid decisions, and, and you know, do these things and more autonomously, you could do a lot more. I could give you a lot of examples, but one example is this. So here's a random video that I pulled out of YouTube. So it's somebody probably rented a Ferrari and, and going around very fast and, and sort of barely misses an accident. And, you know, just in the United States, there's about 30,000 fatalities every year. So it's 100 people dying in accidents every single day. And it's a lot more across the world. So there's about a million deaths per year. Um, and, and you just imagine systems that right at the time of an accident can turn on some very fast sensors and very fast computers and just nudge the car just a tiny bit so that a fatal accident becomes a near miss. Um, I sincerely think that technologies like this could easily be seatbelt 2.0. And so I think um, it's actually quite an interesting um, area to, to, I think, work in. Um, and so there's a lot of things that I would love to touch upon, but one of the things that we've been working a lot on is what I would call the co-design of computing hardware, sensing hardware, and autonomy algorithms. Let me get into that a little bit. Um, and so, you know, like I said earlier, we would like to do these kinds of things, and you know, you're sensing that line of environment very fast, and you'd like to compute on that environment and actuate it extremely fast. So when you're going this fast, you realize that if you were to actually take the imagery as is and just try to put it into a computer, through a serial link, it's just that the amount of data that's coming out of the camera just doesn't fit on copper lines. Like you could look at the channel limit of how much data you can shuttle over a serial line of copper and it just doesn't fit. And so you kind of need to maybe even rethink sensing if you were to do it this fast. Obviously what humans are doing is that they're not seeing the camera images come that fast, but they can somehow do the computing part very well so that they can extrapolate in their mind what exactly is happening and maybe maybe nudge it and they have some interesting things that they're doing, which we could do. But imagine if we were to even surpass humans, maybe one day we need to think about sensing a little bit hard. And same thing even applied to actuation. You know, I'd say that even for actuation, you could imagine different things, interesting things, so that you can do certain sets of maneuvers very, very clearly. So we try to think about how we can we actually like think about sensing, computing, and actuation all together. And when I say think about computing, I mean like let's just take out some GPUs and, 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 and basically build algorithms for GPUs for typical sensors you get on, you know, off the shelf. But I mean, how can we design some new chips and just, just make them very capable right off the bat? Um, and you, know, you can imagine kind of looking at new autonomy algorithms that's obviously not completely done, like there's challenging environments, unmodeled, because you can work on a lot just on autonomy algorithms. But the key would be to to maybe look at some of these things and design the chips from the ground up so that we can do these things extremely fast, maybe even with new sensors. This kind of intersection is not new either. It's actually being explored quite a bit. Like nowadays, you can buy sensors that kind of collect um, light and do the processing right at the, at, at, at the narrow um, part of, of that um, collection of light. So for example, some of the things that people use a lot is the DVS sensors, which is one example, it basically for every pixel, it has a very sim simple computer, it just has a counter and it, 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 it passes that out. But imagine what if we could put more complicated computers right across the pixel so that we could compute kind of quite fast some things that we're really interested in. Um, and there's already kind of work going on in that, I'm not gonna get into, but what I would say is that once we do this, I think another one of the challenges is this sort of simulation and testing parts. I think, you know, many of you working on autonomous racing have kind of already realized it's just that 
To do it well, I think we need to do a lot of trials. It's very hard to do it in real environments just because it takes time, but also because like if you actually make a mistake and if you crash, and sometimes you want to do that, learn from it. If you crash, you just destroyed your robot, which was probably very expensive and took a lot of time to build. And, and so how can we do the testing part probably with simulation very well, and how can we actually bring this sort of you know, computing hardware sensing and all of that together? Um, so we've been working a lot on the computing hardware part, this also applies not just to racing, but maybe miniature vehicles, for example. Um, you can build drones that fit on your fingernail, and if you look at the amount of power that they consume, they consume just about 100 milliwatts to lift themselves. So if you were to use like something like a Jetson computer now we all got used to, it's 10 watts. It's the two orders of magnitude more power. So there's clearly, you know, something like that will not be useful here, where to fly around, to go around, you're using a certain amount of energy and you're using two orders of magnitude more just to turn on and off some transistors so that you can understand what, what is happening around you. Um, and so, you know, at that scale, you really need to, you have to design your computers from the ground up. And, and you know, this has a lot of applications, um, like small flyers, you can think about little satellites that, you know, you can probably propel to other stars, have to be done this way. Uh, or you can imagine like very sort of high endurance robots. So you can imagine like a little blimp that can, you know, fly for years and you can use very little energy. There's a lot more out of the, the domain of aerospace, which is what I'm interested in mostly, but you can imagine like, you know, water striders, printable robots, soft robots, you name it. Um, and I, I'd say that there's actually a lot of problems in this area when you build chips um, and, and you know, algorithms, sort of computing hardware and algorithms from the ground up. We worked on so many things. So we worked on visual inertial localization and SLAM to some degree. We worked on depth sensing because in most of these little you know, vehicles, you have a single camera and you don't, you can't fit a LIDAR typically. So how can you just look at the camera images and, and maybe use some IMU to, to generate that? And also people are very interested in sort of information-based mapping. So, you know, you are mapping an unknown area, where do you go next? And so kind of generating this channel of information map and so on. There's a lot of interesting problems in decision-making. Now I'm kind of outside of the autonomous racing domain, but imagine if you have very little power, you can sit down and, and do a motion planning um, and spend a lot of energy to come up with a motion plan that, you know, kind of expands so little actuation energy, but now you spend a lot of energy to actually come up with it. And so you need to somehow balance that out. So there's a very, I'd say, very interesting problems that come up at this intersection. Um, but, you know, in order to do that, we kind of, one of the first things that we did, for example, was to build a, a chip from the ground up uh, that does visual inertial geometry that is kind of, you know, if you're using only cameras, it will be very useful in all kinds of autonomy. Um, so it measures just by four by five millimeters on silicon itself. So obviously you need to package it, but you can package it that's small or closed. Um, some of the key characteristics are if you run it at 28 frames per second, so now that's kind of slow for racing, but if you run it at that, it expands just two milliwatts of water power. So that's very little. Uh, you can run it at 171 frames a second. So now that's kind of quite fast for racing applications. It could be useful. It's just 24 milliwatts. And so it just kind of shows that, you know, like things that we struggle with um, in putting into GPUs and things like that on a Jetson, um, it's just there's a lot of wasted transistors, wasted silicon in something like Jetson because it just needs to do everything. But if you design these things from the ground up, even on just this much silicon, and we're not even using the same technology, the 65 nanometer node, it's very different than what like something like an NVIDIA Jetson is, is, is kind of built on. We're able to get you know easily something like 171 frames a second and and apply it in these kinds of settings. We're working on a lot of other things, but I'm just gonna jump into the next topic, which is kind of more on the realistic simulation systems. And I have a quick announcement to make there. Um, so we've been working on this for quite a bit also. So you know the Alpha Pilot got mentioned. So we used um, for the Alpha Pilot eliminations um, a simulator that we built called Flight Goggles. And so here the idea is to really make simulation as realistic as possible for an application like racing. And so you can do something quick so that you know you can make um, dynamics and inertial sensing, not just realistic, but actually real. And so what we do with that is a very basic vehicle is just going around in an open, like empty motion capture. It could be a drone or it could be like a small race car, like many of us now use. Um, and then we take its position orientation from there, pass it to a BP computer that's running the game engine, which then renders an environment, renders the extraceptive sensors. Could be cameras, but could also be laser rangefinders, even radar, and then passes it that back to the vehicle. 
Uh, you can put multiple vehicles this way. So for example, you can have two different motion capture rooms and two vehicles racing each other. They could they could collide. They don't actually collide. So you could uh, you know you could do some interesting experiments. One thing we found very useful is to put people in another environment and drones in a different one so that they could just kind of work together. And so here's what that looks like. So here's a drone that's kind of flying in like the off the, the flight goggles um, arena, uh, the, the abundance factory arena, which was also used on, um, on autopilot. So the drone is flying in an empty space, but it's kind of, if you will, hallucinating that other environment. So if you crash into something, it's no big deal. Here's one of my students who is kind of in another motion capture room, but is in the same virtual reality arena from the drone. So the drone is trying to film my student, and that's the avatar that my student chose from top. So this is kind of like a basic idea of what a virtual reality system might look like that we can use for experimentation. Um, in, in the paper, um, if you're interested in looking at it, we also have solutions for, for example, augmented reality. So how can you use the cameras of the, the vehicle itself, but then render and other things if you wanted to take it a step further. Um, so as I said earlier, the dynamics is real. Inertial sensing is real. What's not real is the simulation of the um, extraceptive sensors, for example, cameras. You could ask the question, how can you make that as real as possible? So we use a, photo, we use a technique called photogrammetry. Um, this is a technique that actually has been available for a long time. It recently um, became prominent and you know, people kind of put out tools to push it and we've ourselves in my group also pushed it. The, the idea behind the technique is you want to create a digital replica of a real um, thing that's in the real world. Um, and you go out, take a whole bunch of pictures, and you can then piece these pictures together um, into the object. So this is not much different than like a, like a visual slam. That's pretty much exactly kind of what's happening. Uh, there's a few other details to make it very kind of um, uh, just, uh, just kind of really realistic. But what I would say is that here in this video, what you're seeing is you're seeing the object, that, like a column, a metal column that we photogrammetried. And the little rectangles that you're seeing are actually the pictures that we've taken. And those pictures make up that asset. I think one thing to emphasize is that here, um, you, you, you are not looking into a 3D graphics asset that was modeled by some graphics artist and it's being rendered, it's somebody's imagination, but you're actually looking at the real world. This is a synthesis of a bunch of photographs that you're looking into that are transformed in order to give you what those photographs would look like if you were to looking at it, if you were looking at it from a different perspective. That's basically what it is. So if you were to push it a little bit further, I, I kind of argue that you, you would almost replicate this in, 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 in almost reality as well, because what you're looking at, again, is not some sort of a typical 3D environment, but it is actually some photos transformed in the right way so that you look at it the, the correct way. So for the Alpha Pilot Challenge, we built this abundant factory environment. And so we scanned 85 different objects kind of in a, in a warehouse that we kind of located somewhere in the world. Um, and then using uh, a thousand instances of those 85 objects, we kind of created this almost fantastic looking like a drone racing environment. Um, here, we really focused on kind of the visual complexity, which we thought would be kind of interesting for Alpha Pilot participants. Ultimately, the Alpha Pilot race didn't end up featuring so much visual complexity for a number of reasons that I'm happy to get into in the Q&A if you're interested. But, but the thing is that you know we, we envisioned initially that there'd be a lot of visual complexity, so we kind of put it back. And you know, frankly, people ended up doing very good. So for people who may not be familiar, this was um, my my two uh, very long-term sponsors, Lockheed Martin and Nvidia. Um, you know, have talked to them quite a bit to kind of convince them to do something like this. And and I think they kind of picked it up and they teamed up with the Drone Racing League. We offered a million dollars for the winning team. Um, we kind of prepared a course in the previous environment that you've seen. So you kind of have a start point. You have to go through all these places as fast as possible. You basically build your you know, C code and, and there's another independent um, a company called HeroX that just runs everybody's C code and gives them a, gives them a score. There's some details, for example, we, we gave them the environment kind of completely open source, but we moved the case just a little bit when we were testing people's code. Um, and you know, this is kind of the, a glimpse of the results. So every vehicle flies sort of one by one, but we're just kind of showing them together so that you can see what it looks like. Um, you know, what we observed is that there were a lot of teams that were actually hitting uh, the top speed most of the time. Um, it is very interesting. I mean, it's, it's, it's a simulation environment. It is fairly realistic. It's not the real thing, obviously. It's fairly realistic. It's a simulation environment. Just a few months and people can do so well. 
admittedly, the people who were doing very well were doing these kinds of things in other settings. So they were actually, they had preparation for years and they put that into work for a few months and they were doing really great. It's very hard to do the same thing in, in real. So there's some sort of a simulation to real gap that you know we think a lot about how can we close that somehow. And so for that, you know, we decided that maybe we build like a digital replica of something. And so um, just today, just yesterday, a new paper came out from our group that, or like an update on an old paper came out from our group that we're kind of now releasing two floors, the digital replica of two floors at MIT Study Center. It's a Frank Gehry design building. It's like a landmark of Boston. It also happens to house sort of our home laboratory, laboratory for information and decision systems. Um, and so here you're seeing the outside of the building on one hand and the inside on the other hand. And here are some renderings from the digital replica that we have. So you can see all the ceiling details. This is not a picture. You're looking at a rendering that can be rendered in real time. Um, so you can see all the ceiling details and, and everything in the walls, all the decals and things like that are completely captured. Similarly here, you know, a whole bunch of uh, pictures on the walls, or if you look at the ceiling, for example, all the pipes and things like that across the basement are captured. Here's the first floor, the entrance, so you can see there's like it used to be a radar lab back in the day. So there's a, there's a, there's a big radar kind of standing there and there's a bunch of other things. So. Um, and um, if you're interested, you can go to flight goggles at MIT.edu. I'm just kind of showing like a quick video of what the environment will look like. And you can download it. Um, it's completely done in Unity. I should note that it's actually, um, it's quite difficult to, to, to get to this realism. So we had to take, um, you know, tens of thousands, almost 100,000 pictures, tens of thousands of pictures that are high definition. Um, and we had to also bring in a laser range finder. So this is kind of an industry laser range finder take about 10 minutes to scan one area. And we had to use it many times throughout the Sutter Center to kind of capture it in 3D. Then it took a lot of um, kind of piecing that together using some new algorithms. And also we got help from some companies that would kind of help um, hand clean it so that it could run in, 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 in real time. So if you're interested, flight goggles will now come out uh, with this simulation environment. Um, if you're not a big fan of flight goggles, no offense taken. So you should be able to take our binary and just use it with your own simulation environment and still get the rendering. It's not up yet, but we're also kind of putting together now the Unity assets. So if you have another simulator that uses Unity, you should be able to get all the assets, even move things around and learn in there. I should also say that, you know, we now that we come this far, we actually decided that maybe we also build a, a kind of like a quick um, game in this environment. And so we haven't released it yet. There's a little teaser in the website. Uh, go and take a look at it. There's a bunch of kind of uh, circuits that, that you can run and you can kind of play through. We're going to release this game soon. And as people play the game, the game also records people's trajectories. And trajectories are made available to the community live. And so as people just play it, you'll just kind of keep getting the trajectories live as they play it, like within just a few seconds of delay. And so hopefully those trajectories will help the community to kind of see you know, how people are racing through these environments. Um, we'll be releasing it very soon for Mac and Windows. And later in the year, we'll be releasing it for, um, for, for Xbox and, and, and PlayStation. Um, and so let me kind of uh, quickly pass through. In the last minute, I'd like to also mention that, you know, it was mentioned that we're doing some classes for high school students. And so we kind of started this back in sort of 2016 with these little cars that, you know, we've been or most of the community has been playing around with. Um, and, you know, I, I was personally very excited to just kind of reach out to high school students. Initially, I thought that we would just do some exposure so that they'd get empowered. But really what we realized actually is that they can do a lot of things. And so um, it just really, really empowers them. And so we've been doing this for a while now. In 2016, we had 46 students. Then we scaled that in 26, 2017 to 100. 2018, we had 200 students. 2019, we had 250 because like we just don't didn't have space at MIT to kind of bring them in. They come in for a whole month and they spend a whole month at MIT. It's completely sponsored by our sponsors, including you know some of the people that I mentioned. Um, they don't pay a dime for this program. Um, and they come in and we can work with them. Um, we recently started a middle school program in 2019, uh, which is very different than high schoolers. So I kind of realized that it's difficult learning. Um, and we've also kind of done, uh, you know, programs with underrepresented students. Like we've run many all girls classes. You know, they've done amazing things throughout. And and I think 
for example, middle school old girls, I think they they just get a bit of an exposure in in a, in a very safe environment, and it just make I think it makes a big difference uh, when they go out. They don't, you know, many of them I think are a little bit afraid. They they think that this is very complicated, difficult technology. But when they play with it, I think next time the opportunity comes, they say, "Oh, I've done it. I know how it works. I can go out and do it." I think that's the main aim. And so now we'll transition the status center environment into a a kind of a if you will, like a development environment that people can play with. Uh, we're working with you know, a few companies so that we can do cloud simulation and streaming. So you can imagine you can do pretty realistic simulations on the cloud, but you stream the camera image. When you stream it, it's not very detailed. So we, we're kind of doing these things. We're going to release kind of um, the, the cars that we're playing with at least. Now we have like three versions that range from $500 to $5,000. Um, and this is available throughout the community now, but. Um, we'll, we'll have some of that that kind of, you know, we put some interesting things on and we'll just release that open source. And finally, we'll have like a few classes there. So if you wanted to do like some really machine learning thing, and you're like a um, high school student, you should be able to do that. So with that, I'd like to conclude. Uh, thank you so much. I hope I was on time. I couldn't quite keep track of it. Um, no, you're good on time. And wow, that was, that was amazing. Thanks, Sir Tash. Thank you. Thank yeah. you so much. Uh, I was familiar with flight goggles.